Can you all hear me? It's hard for me to know whether this is in a right or not. Good morning. I'm Bonnie Casper. I'm the immediate past president of the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors, a local realtor association with over 8,500 members in Montgomery County and the District of Columbia. And I'm also the regional vice president for the Maryland Association of Realtors. It's my pleasure to be hosting the panel today. The District of Columbia's real estate values are climbing again at a rate of four a little bit over 4% year over year during the month of March. For example, the median price was up um, over 13.58% and the average price was probably around $567,000 in the District of Columbia. In Montgomery County, the increase was over 10% um, for the average sales price year over year during the month of March and that equated to approximately $485,000. Much of this is caused by the lack of inventory, but much is caused by the dramatic increase in home buyers all wanting the same product. To be near mass transit, stores, entertainment, etc., or what we as realtors refer to as the walkability factor. Developers and local governments are looking to deal with the density and cost factor by encouraging micro-units. What is a micro-unit? Is, is it just a new term of art for what we used to call efficiencies or studios? Sometimes yes, or as you will hear in Fairfax County, they are still being referred to as studios. A quick survey around the country shows that, for example, in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg is a great proponent of the construction of micro-units, and the city has sponsored a design comp uh, competition. New York City is so expensive, as we all know, that even the tiniest of apartments are offered approximately between $915 per month to $1,870 per month. And those are considered affordable. Many of these units are only between 250 square feet and 370 square feet. As I said, very tiny. Mayor Bloomberg is encouraging the development to deal with the large demand for housing, especially among the young seeking jobs who are willing to live in a unit that is really just the size of the dorm room they may have just left. In Boston, the story is a little bit different. Boston's mayor, Thomas Menino, is unlikely to allow, allow large numbers of micro-apartments in the next few years citing the need to protect living standards and ensure that units are reasonably priced. Boston has permitted approximately 195 small units of 355 square feet to be built in the South Boston Innovation District. These units command approximately $1,700 or more a month. However, until the mayor and his staff are satisfied with what are the appropriate standards and whether increasing density is a good thing, he is finding alternative ways to increase affordable housing. For example, he announced a plan to build 30,000 new affordable housing units by the year 2020, and these do not include micro-units. One other city is worth noting, Seattle. It has a population similar to the District of Columbia and has been a leader in the development of micro-units. I've read articles that cite as many as 48 projects have been approved since 2006. And these are at a size of approximately 150 to 200 square feet each. These are being marketed to young people, students, and retirees. Seattleites are now, however, not so sure that the dramatic increase is really good, and opponents of the movement to build micro-units is seeking a moratorium until the city can analyze the pros and cons and determine if additional regulations are necessary. What does all this portend for this area? I chaired an economic development roundtable a year and a half ago on behalf of the realtors at the White Flint development sector, and one of the speakers talked about offering micro-units for sale that were 350 square feet, approximately. The realtors thought that they would not sell in our markets. It would be difficult to have residents who are used to their sprawling mansions on two acres or more, or even in the five-bedroom, four-bath house, 
houses in a place like Bethesda, being willing to move to some place that would be no better than what they remembered when they were students. This morning, we will address the many issues these examples raise. What is the target for the purchase of the purchasing? How are they being designed to be more desirable and flexible? Is the pricing really affordable? And are they just going to be a phase in development, or are they really the wave of the future? I leave it to our panelists to discuss. And when we have finished, when the panelists are through, then we will take questions. So take note while they're speaking, because we do have the experts here. Thank you very much. Um, the first speaker will be David Friedlander. Um, David takes care of the communications and community at Life Edited. And his background is in writing and event management. And he is with some of the leading groups in New York City. And he will talk about um, what is happening there. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm David Friedliner. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I work with a company like that. I did, uh, she gave you my bio, so I am not uh, an architect. I'm not a designer. I'm not a urban planner. I'm not a writer. So I'm, I'm more of a, a digester of information. Um, I work with Life Edited, as, as she mentioned. And really what we're about is trying to start a, what I would call a, um, what we say is like a design, architectural, and lifestyle movement around doing more with less. And we really just kind of just started on, on an idea, sort of on, on a few. So it was started by a, a guy named Graham Hill, who uh, founded a, a website called treehugger.com. And we really wanted to, we we're kind of out to, to prove a point. Um, so I, I'm going to talk in general, we're, I'm going to talk specifically what we're doing, then talk more in general about what's going on around the country. Um, so, you know, our project has been featured in the New York Times, and Dwell, and Wired, and Today Show, and we've received a lot of, uh, received a lot of attention for, for what we're doing, and I'll show you what, what, what that is we're doing. Uh, I really think it's a cultural, it's a real resonant message to people um, about just being overwhelmed by sort of the, the, the growth of, 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 our, of our lives. So, we're basically, Basically, we, were, we, we wanted to present a challenge, um, really how to do more with less. And, and it started off with the fact that America's proportions have gotten increasingly <coughs> large. Our cars have gotten larger. Our portions have gotten larger. Uh, this is a perfect example. Uh, in, in the 50s, an eight ounce soda was constituted a serving size, and now we have these, you know, drugs of soda. Um, so, and of course that extends to housing. In 1950, and we usually kind of, kind of use that as the baseline, you know, following World War II, in 1950, the average size of a new home was 983 square feet. And there were 3.37 people in those homes. By 2000, in 2011, that same figure was uh, in excess of 2,400 square feet uh, for a, a new home. And there's 2.6 people in, in the average size household. So our house <coughs> have gotten you know, much bigger, and yet we, we're fitting less people in them. So we're taking up about three times, on average, across, across the US, we're taking up three times as much space as we did in 19. And then you think that with all that space that we have so much room to, for all of our stuff. But we don't. We, we have a $22 billion storage industry. And what does it hold? That. <laughs> Whatever that is. You know, our two coolers and our, our spare TV that we might use when you know, our dog leaves the house or something. So, um, and then. This is actually a, a self-reported happiness study. So basically, we have more space, way more stuff. We actually have, a, in terms of real dollars, we have a higher GDP. And yet, uh, the, the squiggly line there represents our self-reported happiness. So we're actually, we're no happier than we were in you know, 1950. And in addition to that, we've become a nation of debtors. Uh, the average credit card debt holder carries
carries over fifteen thousand dollars of credit card debt. Uh, uh, you know, the, the numbers are just as staggering. I think it's around one hundred forty thousand dollars of mortgage debt, um, and student loan debt is is is, is in, in that category as well. And then CO2, you know, in terms of our environmental fur footprint, America makes I think around four percent of the world population, yet we consume about a quarter of its resources. Uh, so we have more debt, more carbon dioxide, and we're no happier. So we, we're proposing that there's another way. And what we like to say is less can equal more. And when done right, when the proper design, the proper architectural thinking, with the use of technology, we can really design compelling lives that allow us to live within our economic means and environmental means, and really, uh, and also just have sort of mental freedom. I mean, uh, my, my wife and I moved into a larger house, and, and you know, it's a pain in the butt to clean, you know? Like, things like that, you know, just allowing uh, uh, more, more life, uh, less stuff, more life. So, we started off with, uh, we, we wanted to prove our point through, through design and architecture. And we, Started off with what we call the Life Editor Department Monitor, LE1. And it's a, it was a 420 uh, square foot New York City apartment. Uh, this is what it looked like before. And uh, we, wanted, we really wanted to show that you could have an amazing place in, in a tiny footprint. So we put out a very demanding brief. We wanted to have dinner parties. And listen, now, I'll, I'll get to the affordable part. And this, is the, this is the over the top part. Uh, we put out a very demanding brief. We, we, we wanted to have dinner parties for 12 people. We wanted a great, we have get civil guest accommodations for two people. We wanted to have a home office, like all these things, really unheard of in a small space. So we put out a, we put out a, a crowdsource competition and it, like put it out into the internet and have at it. So we got 304 entries from around the world uh, to design the space. And the winning designers were a couple of Romanian architecture students, um, and actually one of them is still working with us. Um, we're, we've, we've, we're subsequently we're working on doing large developments. And uh, this is the winning design. Uh, it's called One Size Fits All. This is actually this is a real picture, and this is the apartment today. So this is the this is the living room configuration. Um, that's the standing desk. If you if you sit less than three hours a day, you will live two extra years. <laughs> but if you don't care about those two years, there's a stool right behind that. <laughs> uh, here's the master bed that flips down over the couch. Um, and then here is the guest room. And we close it off with curtains uh, to get a little privacy. Uh, here, is the, uh, here is the living room configuration. This is a table that starts off as a 17-inch console and expands to 115, wow. cube, uh, 115, 115 inches. Uh, and we can easily sit 10, uh, 12 an inch. Uh, what we're not saying, we're not saying 420 square feet is, is, is a prescribed amount. We're not saying that everyone has the same needs. Uh, I'm a family, we need bigger, you know, a grand who lives in this apartment. We, we save the apartment all the time. It's not quite big enough for, for my family. But what, we're, what we are saying is that you know, we can all really evaluate our lives and see what is really important to us and kind of design a life around that. And, and by and large, when we, when, we find, when, when we do that, we end up with a much smaller number than, uh, than, than uh, kind of status quo dictates. So um, I'm just going to go through quickly here. Uh, this is just sort of some design strategies that um, that we like to promote, you know, transformational, uh, transforming, let's see, transforming furniture. This is a really cool table that's, you know, it starts off as a coffee table and then turns into an eight person dining room table. Um, I thought since this is an affordable uh, housing conference, that you can make the same table out of IKEA parts for about 100 bucks. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a nifty little chair. Um, Uh, we're big proponents of digitizing, uh, you know, get as much as possible, getting e-readers and, and streaming media and really reducing the volume. Like, you know, having a smaller space requires lifestyle changes. Um, scanning, scanning documents, really getting rid of clutter. I mean, these, these things are so easy and most of them are free. Uh, 
to, to do it. Low cost, and you know, most people have smartphones nowadays. Uh, we'd say edit ruthlessly, really looking at uh, our possessions and the amount of stuff, and you know that that awesome shirt that you've been waiting to wear for the last three years. Get rid of it. Um, right sizing things. Uh, this is a really interesting. I, I can't recommend this enough. There's these towels called waffle towels that take up about a half to a third of the volume. They, they dry faster. They actually get you drier. Uh, than, than the you know, big blanket, uh, a king size towel. Uh, we promote an idea of less but better. One thing we say is like if something costs twice as much but lasts four times as long, it's effectively half the price. Uh, you know, like a great cast iron top. Um, and then, you know, one of the interesting things is uh, what we call sharing systems. And, you know, uh, technology is really making it possible for us to get the things that we need without actually owning it. One of the things we need to say is, Access over ownership. So this is a New York City uh, bike pro, uh, bike share that's just launched last month. There's going to be 10,000 bikes across New York City in 600 locations. You can just put a card in there and, and grab your bike. Or uh, BMW actually has this thing called uh, Drive Now, and you can actually turn on your phones in Germany and San Francisco, and you can basically look down the street, find an available car, take it for a ride, and then and then uh, and and leave it wherever you want uh, within within a zone. Okay, so that's so that's us. That's life edited. Um, what it says, uh, the state of the of the union. And this is a kind of a more for what's going on in general. Uh, you know, as 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 was mentioned, the Adapt NYC competition was uh, was a big hit. Uh, with Bloom, uh, the Bloomberg administration launched the Adapt NYC competition. Basically, uh, it's responding to dem first of all demographic shifts, and this is something that I was thinking a lot of about is uh, is people are living people are increasingly li living alone and I actually found these earlier today um, basically in 1950 10% of the US population was living alone today it's 28% I actually looked it up quickly it's in, in Montgomery County it's about uh, I think it's 24% or yeah 24% and in major in major cities it's about 35 45% in New York City it's over 50% so it's about designing homes that actually are congruent with with, with, with population. Um, and then with the ADAPT NYC, it was built around what's called Plan NYC, which is Bloomberg's uh, proposal for to prepare for New York City for 2030, where they expect, I think, another 600,000 residents by 2030. And yet, the housing stock really doesn't doesn't match up with, uh, I, I think I, I'd seen like something like 1.5% of the Housing stock is, is listed as, as studios in New York City. So, so if you put up this RFP for the, the Adapt NYC, right now, actually, New York is not that. I mean, the, the existing housing stock is actually pretty micro as it is, but you can only build as small as 400 square feet right now. So, in, in New York City, so if you so the, the Adapt NYC had a, had a waiver on that, and you could build between 375 and 3, 325. And we were actually, Life Edit was on one of the teams with John and Rosen Company and a number of other uh, great partners. And this was our, this was our um, entry. Uh, we were finalists. We didn't win. I'm not going to show you the winner. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the big thing is that we did do the interiors, a lot of it based on what we found in the first Life Edit. Uh, it's just some, yes, you know, pictures. A lot of transforming furniture. But, you know, the big thing is like making, making small spaces livable, and I think that would be my big point here as, a, you know, we're mostly a design, design uh, company. So really, it's, it's small spaces are not created equally. You know, you could have, a, you know, a, a, a closet, a walk-in closet, we call it a micro-apartment. This is about, you know, creating a compelling place to live, regardless of your, of your income. Um, this is, a, this is a building that was just built in San Francisco uh, at 38 Harriet Street in the Selma District. This is actually 23 uh, prefab, pre prefabricated units. Each unit is 290 square feet. This is the interior of that. Uh, it has a little table there that uh, is on a hydraulic lift and it compresses down and becomes a bench and it has a murky bed that you can't see here. Uh, so these are just, uh, I'm just showing you a couple things that are going on around the country. Uh, this is actually one of my favorites. This is in Providence, Rhode Island. And this is uh, the, the, or the country's oldest shopping mall uh, from 1828. It's called Providence Arcade. And what they're doing is they're actually leaving the, the ground floor residential at the top two floors 
are micro units and are uh, usually right around 250 square feet. And this is actually unlike, unlike Adapt, I mean Adapt, the Adapt proposal and San Francisco are unfortunately burdened by their host cities' ungodly rents. Uh, so the, the one I showed you before, sixteen hundred dollars a month. But these guys are, are about they start around five hundred square feet, and I, I really think this is a, a really cool project. This is an interior shot of that. Um, there is a little bit of movement. This is a, in, in, in D.C. This is a, uh, a building that's going up on 9th Street uh, uh, Southwest, and they're going to be uh, 300. There's going to be studios as small as 320 square feet. This is the apartments, uh, the, the thing uh, that was mentioned in, in Seattle, and we can talk more about that later. But these are so the average size of the apartments, I believe, are 100, 170 square feet, and it's basically an all-inclusive. Uh, you know, furnished room, all, all utilities paid, and and there's a lot of community outcry about it. But it's a lot of it is is, is people not, uh, you know, as they say, not in my backyard. You know, we want we want sustainable development. We want, you know, we want to have affordable housing, but we don't want to do anything different. Um, and you know, these are these are giving providing affordable housing. As far as I know, they're not uh, increasing increasing crime. There's there's some complaint about. Parking situation. Uh, Suppose that one of the developers said that about 10% of the of the residents uh, own cars. So this is you know not they're near tra uh, they're near transit hubs. So you know th this is a, 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 a definitely a point of contention. And and, uh, and, and the city is actually the, Se the city of Seattle is quite in favor of that. Um, and I'll just just kind of briefly go th go through here. You know, rethinking SROs. Again, back to, back to my point, which is that not all things are created equally. You can design, you can design beautiful small homes, and even ones that, you know, this is a this is the um, uh, Harold and Margot uh, Ship residence in New York City, is designed by Murphy Yan, and it's uh, it's it's an SRO, and it had, I mean just super innovative. It has a it gets 15 percent of its power from from wind turbines, as you know, well lit, beautiful. Uh, you know, accommodations. Uh, this is another one called the um, uh, what is this? The uh, the Bud Clark Residence in Portland, and you can you know really build beautiful, affordable housing. And these you know these are effectively micro units. <laughs> um, and this is another one in Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, called the Hedgeman Residence uh, that have you know nice sunny uh, accommodations. And you know this 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 is something you know far more. Far more modest in terms of price. You know, uh, has a green roof on it. So I guess you know. In conclusion, whether you know whether we're talking about affordable housing or or even just for the general population, this idea of really uh, not being forced into a a life of less, but actually choosing it, like saying this is this is something that allows me to live you know responsibly, economically, environmentally. And actually supports supports you know, supports my, my life and my and, and my well being. Uh, so that's that, that's me. Uh, that's my URL and that's my email address. If you have any questions, uh, and I look forward to hearing from the other paths. Thanks. I'll just speak from here. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. My name is Donna Pesto, and I'm with the Zoning Administration Department in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, you heard Paula Sampson earlier from our um, housing office uh, speaking with regard to the impacts of the, the sequestration on, uh, on their efforts. Um, we have approached our, um, our need for additional housing and small unit housing uh, from the affordable perspective for the most part. We are looking at it um, initially strictly as uh, something that we can do to increase affordability. Um, you know, Fairfax is not immune to the uh, overpriced housing um, that, that we see, um, and, and in part because they're huge houses. Uh, um, so we, we have those, um, those issues that have brought us here. Um, we have been working on, um, in terms of developing from a zoning perspective, we have been working on some housing product type that will get us there. And what, what you have passed out is something that, you know, just happened on Tuesday this week. 
um, our board authorized us to distribute for, um, for comment our idea for what we're calling residential studios. Um, we, I, I need to say this before I forget, if I wait till the end, I'll forget. It says in your memo that um, the address for where you can send comments is in the letter, and in fact, it is not. So I'm going to give it to you now. Um, if, if anybody wants it, or you can just use the email address, but the uh, address is 12055 Government Center Parkway, Fairfax, Virginia. Um, 12035. Um, the, the product that we're looking at is, um, in terms of size, we're looking at something that's no more than 500 square feet, but it has to be an efficiency. Uh, no, no one bedrooms, two bedrooms. It has to be an efficiency. Um, from the, the code that we rely on for a minimum size is our uh, building code, uh, Fairbanks County building code, which would require a minimum of 220 square feet plus a bathroom and a kitchen space. So realistically, you might get something in like 280 or 290. So that'll be our minimum size that we can allow. More than the four, or less than the 400 in New York, so it might, might help with the affordability there, but also smaller than what San Francisco is using, which is 120, I understand that at that size now. So we're looking for things between, you know, minimum of 220 plus a kitchen and bathroom, maximum of, of uh, 500 square feet. Um, the, the demand that's brought us here is um, in accordance with uh, some of the studies we've done. By 2025, we, we will have the need for um, 16,000 new units to serve households under the um, income limit of 60% of AMI. That's 16,000 additional units. Um, David spoke to the, the increasing desire to live alone. Um, and in uh, Fairfax, in the 2011 survey that we did the last day that we had, we have 85,000 households out of very much, out of under 400,000. 85,000 of them are individually occupied units. And unfortunately, we have a 67,000 unit um, uh, base of rental units, and less than 1,400 of them are studio units. So we do not have a lot of uh, efficiency units or studios or micro units or whatever, metro units I read this week, um, one of the new names. We don't have a lot, and we are doing what we can to, uh, to encourage that. So that, that gets us to our, um, our proposal. What, what we are looking at uh, creating will be all efficiency units. They'll be for predominantly 80% of the units um, or more have to be for an income population of 60% uh, or less. It's a rental only uh, endeavor. It's, these are not condos um, uh, for sale. And the beauty that we see of this use, um, you know, the zone, sometimes the, the zoning requirements that we have to meet, what we have to meet in order to meet all of our zoning tests, um, seem counterintuitive, but, but for our purposes um, in establishing this use, um, we're going to create it as its own use, not just lump it in with any other multifamily, you know, which is basically what it is, just a multifamily use. It's just that the units are a little more regulated. But we're going to create it as its own use and then allow it to go in almost every single zoning district that we have in, in, the, uh, in our zoning ordinance. It's all residential, all industrial, and all commercial. And, there are, and it's an approval that is required specifically from our Board of Supervisors. Um, and some of the tests that they'll be looking at is compatibility. You might think initially that you know, it's not compatible to put housing in an industrial district. Um, we do actually have one development that we consider, you know, kind of our only SRO. That's in an industrial district, um, and, and it happens to be developed with the housing department's office. Um, it's on the first floor of their office building, so it is compatible. Um, it's a good fit. Um, so we think that we can make arguments going forward that there are lots of other opportunities for those kinds of um, those kinds of fits. Um, we are soliciting uh, input from anybody who wants to give it. There's a lot of reasons to look at this. Um, you, know, with, you mentioned people don't want to live next door to it, and, and we want to hear from those people as much as we want to hear from the people who are willing to come in and build these units, because it has to work. Um, you know, we struggled with this for years. I think they started looking at residential studios back when they called them SROs um, in the early 90s. Um, and we're still having the same discussion and we still don't have it on our books. So, you know, we, we need to move forward with this and actually have a product that, um, that makes sense. 
and getting everybody's comments, you know, that help shape it will will hopefully uh, get us there. So it, it's a little bit different from what we see in other areas where, I mean, this is sort of the hit happening thing um, in terms of units in some of the more urban areas. We want some of these in Tyson's Corner that are, our green development in Tyson's Corner that are going to be sort of the hip happening units with all that movable furniture and all that other stuff. Uh, but the units that we're talking about here is going to be the IKEA furniture and uh, some of the uh, some of the maybe uh, not quite so tricked out design features um, that will keep it affordable, that will make it um, you know practical to produce, easy to run as a rental program, and make people want to live there because they are going to be uh, new and different, and they'll start to fill some of the gaps that we have with um, with the needs that Fairfax County specifically has. Um, for efficiency units, for low-priced units, um, and for units that make sense for somebody to live um, individually. And, and the basis for that will simply be income. It doesn't matter why their income is low, um, whether they are you know, in a low-paying job or have no job or are elderly or retired or you know, recently divorced or whatever somebody's circumstance is, it's simply an income cap. So that has become Fairfax's approach to sort of stepping into the micro unit, metro unit, residential studio, whatever it's called. Um, and again, the, the solicitation that we have, we, we genuinely want to hear from anybody who can offer us assistance in this and, uh, and will get us moving forward quickly. Thank you. Um, for us, this all started before this with SROs and PLQs. PLQs 
our personal living quarters, which is what Montgomery County calls an SRO. Um, and, you know, we started, uh, we've done a number for the county, um, and, but we didn't envision that as housing for um, the market. It, it, SROs are really aimed at people who are um, having support, need supported services, et cetera. But it allowed us to test some ideas about how big the unit should be. Um, this one is on in right in the middle of Bethesda, and here we actually even looked at putting um, in an SRO, not in an efficiency or studio, but in an SRO putting the shower facilities that are fully private but outside the unit, so that two or three units can share that, um, but they have each have their own privacy when they're using it. Um, but so we've gotten down to what we said was smaller but not yet micro and we started to look at a lot of ideas and one of the problems that I think stymies a lot of people um, in the Washington area is the 60 foot module that housing is thought of as and right now most of the sites that you come across don't necessarily work exactly for a 60 foot module we've got a whole 20 30 pages on on how that works in if you, if you stick to the 20 foot module, all of a sudden you end up, or 27 foot module, you end up having to spread long corridors out and have um, a lot of space utilized by that. With overlapping spaces, you can really start to, to micro um, size the units. <coughs> the idea of the boxcar unit that you saw earlier, where we might have a full glass wall, but because of the codes changing, a lot of people don't realize this, but you can do, in the old days, you had to have windows in every bedroom and in every lift and the lift. You don't have to have that now because the code allows you to, or requires you to bring outdoor air into the unit. And that was why you, one of the reasons you needed to have um, uh, the, the exposure because of wanted ventilation. And they've also recognized that lighting. So, as, as you'll see in a couple slides, you know, you can introduce light back into these deeper units, and these deeper units actually start to also cut your gross square footage down, which it's not only the size of the building, but it's uh, of the unit, but it's the size of the, the building. And a micro unit or a, a boxcar unit has less corridor length per unit, and therefore cuts your core factor in your units. I'm not saying everything should be a, a boxcar. So this is a building that I did not consider to be anything new, a micro unit that we're doing. We're doing two of these um, on in the southwest right now. Um, two towers, 12 stories. They actually happen to be old office buildings. And interestingly enough, they're 110 feet wide. And so as you can see here, we started working with normal units where it seemed to work because we saved the core. But we also started working with the boxcar units and started to look at, hey, we don't, the market even in Southwest isn't just going to be the singles. Um, in this case, our efficiency is 370 square feet. We didn't consider that um, micro and the market people or the marketing people told us that, that was a saleable product. 310, they disagreed with us. But all of these units probably qualify if you start to use a slightly higher um, square footage. But utilizing different types of units is what I'm, I'm trying to get into this. And also recognize that you can mix the demographics. One thing that this building, these buildings don't do, and I think the housing industry has to start resolving, is this is efficiency in ones, and it's two bedrooms, but two bedrooms that are actually master, two masters, double masters. Everybody's got their own bathroom, everybody's got their own bedroom, common living space. It's not a family unit. If you try to put a couple and two children into that kind of unit, it doesn't make sense. So you need to start talking about that. Um, not everything needs to be one bedroom. Um, you know, some of the custom design or, or specialty items that you can put into these things really start to sell. In this case, we've got uh, at Southwest Towers this system that tucks into a place inside of the 
in case you want to not use it, it becomes a cutting board, but when it's at one point it becomes storage for another, it's got appliances built into it, and it's also for a four person eating table. So it's, you know, flexibility comes out of that. We started to look and explore what really works in, say, a kitchen. Because too many people sacrifice usability for micro, microscopy, whatever the, the term would be. Um, and then unique design elements, so neat needs of extended space, you know, defining bedrooms with sliding doors. Um, we have in that the, the large apartment complex that I was talking about, um, big transom lights to let light bounce in. But then for our bedrooms that are way deep in the unit, they have translucent sliding doors like these to make that so that, that becomes a special area. Um, the boxcar unit leads to the efficiency which we talked about. But also one of the other things that we found is there's a lot of great materials out there, especially with the new green materials that you really have to keep up because a product that you might be using today that's costing you five fifty, what you per, put for say flooring, there's other flooring out there that meets the same need, is actually more durable at four twenty five. And if we can do that, we can put more uh, make these units more affordable to everybody. Um, design cells, you know, everybody's starting to realize that and affordable to market rate because everybody wants to have something that they can be proud of. Um, this talks about the various layout. You know, not only does design cell, but the amenities. Where, what kind of amenities do you offer in a building? Um, and again, you need to recognize the demographics. Those two buildings that I mentioned, I love those two buildings that I mentioned. It's, it's now called Sky House. Great projects, except when we started designing, I'm like, boy, my wife and I could take two units at the top floor, and put that out of the water, be wonderful. Well, the amenity spaces are geared towards the 20 and 30 something. And we would stand out like sore thumbs in that building. Um, and so if you really are trying to create a mixed demographic building, you need to make your amenities meet the mixed demographics. Um, this is a building we're doing right now, you know, where we're actually mixing micro units and full size units and actually some SROs and trying to, to really create a community within a building. It says retail, it says a lot of other things. But utilizing the green space on top of the roof as an amenity. You know, this is a very urban site where we're wall, we're property line, property line. Um, but all of that making use of that space and make, you know, here we've got on our uh, zinc part to the right, we've got box cars on one side and typical units on the other. Um, uh, we, one of the things that I am worried about personally is that there's going to be this approach for the, this cell concept. And I, don't, I, I tried to find a slide and I couldn't, but if you ever saw the movie The Fifth Element, you know, people are living in these individual cells, they're a pod, everything's exactly the same. And that's, to me, not an empowering element in housing. And I, I truly think that people get a lot of um, their self-worth out of what they're, they're doing. So living in that kind of unit is for some people, but not for everybody. Um, and then, in closing, you know, this micro is not new. Um, my daughter just moved into this apartment on Capitol Hill with two other women. It's a three bedroom unit, it's a nine nice gross square feet, including the exterior wall thicknesses. Um, each of the bedrooms is 11 by 4 by 11, really nice size bedrooms. Um, but one of the things that they've done to make it more livable, and you can see how this is designed in the 50s, but not designed recently, the bedroom doors are not on this long corridor. If they face out in their, their back windows face out into a courtyard. Um, 
it's, it's actually 263 square feet each. What she, she's design oriented and comes from our family that's pretty design oriented. So she talked the other two women into replacing a lot of their furniture with specialty pieces from Ikea. Simple, cheap, because they're young and they can't afford much. But also, they all wanted to have something that reminded them of home. And I think that that's one thing <coughs> too that these fully designed micro units don't recognize. People want to have something, people have things that, that they want to have in their units. And so you need to, to recognize them. So she'll thank you for showing me. But, you know, we found this 11 inch wide desk. She does a lot of high end graphics, so she's got this big computer. But you know, we got her a tiny keyboard, and it's got um, some pieces to it that to give her some storage. And for her, she wanted to have a queen size bed in a tiny unit because that's something that was important to her. And she, this was when she hadn't cleaned up, but um, <laughs> but you can. Again, in this tiny of a unit, or this small of a unit, make it happen. Um, but then finally, my question is, if, if we're talking about 310 for one, for SRO, or I'm sorry, for efficiency or studio, or if we're talking about even under that for um, units, will the Washington market accept it? Um, as I said earlier, the management people that we've talked to have always been pushing us to make them as big as possible. The, the developers are trying to keep it so that they can make the numbers work. So there's a, a, a squish there. We'll see what happens. I don't think that Washington will ever get to Asia, Asian sizes or New York sizes. Um, and particularly, you know, a lot of my work actually is focused in D.C. But you move out to Montgomery County or Loudoun County and you or Fairfax, you need to recognize that there there is going to be a different transmission of side of the scale. So thank you. After listening to all of these comments, I can't wait to call my daughter and tell her that her 450 square foot efficiency down at uh, Duke Concert Hall really is way too big. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. I certainly do. Um, and but uh, let me just ask the audience first um, to ask any questions. Would somebody want to start off? Or yes, ma'am. The designs allow you. You know, I see that you can make a really efficient design small. My question is, just because you made it smaller, is it cheaper? Is it really affordable, or just little? <laughs> I think the numbers, I think, a lot of money for a smaller I think from a realtor perspective, the numbers that you've been quoting, if you kind of work it backwards and you say, what does somebody have to earn in order to be able to rent that particular cost? Yes, it might be smaller, but how affordable is it? Sky House, the fourth and down, we have twenty percent affordable units. Half of those are affordable at sixty percent of median and the other half are affordable at 40% of median. Um, that's a pretty high percentage. It's only 8.5% uh, including their zoning in DC that came through the developer and the zoning process to get that. So, um, so yes. And in fact, the other units do subsidize the cost of building those units in some way. But that's, that's the way it works. That's the way it should work. And that's why a mixed income building Make so much more sense than building eight stories of affordable housing in Gaithersburg and 12 stories of high end housing in the festival. Okay, but so I'm thinking about it. So the ones you made were I mean, in, in Seattle, they're, they're, they're not subsidized housing, and I think they usually start 
around six hundred five to six hundred dollars for a, an all inclusive space, and people are making you know minimum wage or a little bit over, over minimum wage are living in these places, and and they're living in, in decent neighborhoods too, uh, which should, should be said. And the fact that they tend to be located near transit hubs allows them you know to live without a car, which saves money. So it's kind of a kind of a holistic package. So it, it can be done, uh, assuming that regulation is is set up for it. And now there's a lot of people in these nice neighborhoods that are saying, no, we don't want all these people, you know, all these single people living here. And, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying that's the, that's the whole picture, but um, in, in, in a lot of contexts, it does seem like these are providing affordable housing, uh, particularly for, for singles. It doesn't necessarily answer the question for, for families, but. And yes, um, I just, uh, talking about that holistic approach there, um, it's already an issue in inner cities to have access to affordable fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, do these take into account the fact that they, you know, there's no porch, there's no yard, there's no way of uh, growing your own? Do they, do they work to try to address that, to have community gardens available? Is, is, that, a, is that something that they're I would addressing? like to add to that, because one of the thoughts I had was you clearly can't have a very big refrigerator, you can't have a very big stove, you don't, certainly don't have counter space. So that would also, in my world, necessitate probably eating out more or buying prepared foods out more, not just being able to grow it, which adds cost to somebody and, and the holistic approach. How healthy is that? Has, has that been taken into account? Well, again, back to Seattle, uh, they have little kitchenettes, and then, but they also have a community kitchen that you can use. Uh, one of the things that should be said is that it allows entry into neighborhoods where where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, so it gives you a, a cheaper entry point into, into a neighborhood. Uh, and that's one of the big things you're, I, I think, uh, you know, you were saying you, amenities over space. So you are sacrificing space for amenities. And I mean, I know as I was, I was, I was a single guy one time, you can do a lot with a hot plate. Which was growing, you know. I mean, uh, Suburban versus downtown core area. What what do you find? Well, the the product we're looking at has like fifteen percent open space requirement on the lot, so there is available space on the lot. We also would, in certain circumstances, we would have setback requirements that might increase that uh, overall percentage of openness. Um, we don't make a specific accommodation, and I, and I think. Um, <coughs> But it's not necessarily that the appliances are smaller either. I think for the most part, I mean, it's a full-size kitchen. It's a small kitchen. You know, it's not a big room with an island and all these other things. It's a small kitchen, but I think for the most part, the uh, the products in the kitchen are all full-size. Uh, but for, for our Fairfax County product, we are looking at having a, a lot. It won't be wall-to-wall -wall, uh, development for the entire lot. In that greater is of the square foot patients in the studio I talked about. It's a full size refrigerator, or full size. Full size stove. Full size portable yeah. stove. Um, we have washer dryers in every unit. In those types of units, we actually put them oh. under the counter in the kitchen area, and we use the European full site you know, wash dry right. units. Um, but you you have a fully amenitized kitchen. And one, one of the slides talked about you, know, you do have to have cutting space. You, know, you do have to have sit, sit down space. People will. Although you live two years longer. <laughs> people will not buy or register if you don't provide enough space. So you have to. Yes, in the back. Uh, question about the idea of the um, income mix uh, property that sounds very good. Uh, Michael, when you mentioned that the <coughs> the, uh, the market uh, rents offset the affordables, are you saying? Um, not charging any more for it. It's just because of the cost of the um, uh, management and the, and the cost of, um, I guess, the um, service that would, um, uh, would balance out. Is that what you're saying? Mostly the, the rent for those units being at those levels don't actually cover the full construction cost of that unit. Um, and so the other units rents help offset that construction cost. Okay, so you're actually kind of breaking even, or you're actually? Oh, they're, they're, they're doing really well. Oh, they're doing well. Okay. At the market, um, um, 
Right. Yeah, no, yeah, because of this location, you know, and that's why I think, again, this location is going to have, I think, from what I've been told from the market people, going to be the highest rent per square foot in the district when it opens. I, I want to, I'm a commissioner on HOC as well. You know, I advocate so much for, we need to do that in Bethesda. We need to get more than 12 and a half percent inclusionary zoning in, in everybody's code so that every building is a truly mixed income building. And the developers say it doesn't work, but this, the two developers on this are very well-known large developers and they made 20% work. And they may, you know, we're, we're spending 60 some million bucks on the buildings. There's often a bonus as well. You get a bonus for the project in, in exchange for <coughs> affordable components. So you may get more market rate product in exchange for providing some at a control rent or price. That's how fair Yes, ma'am. How do you restrict the number of people that they live in these? For example, a couple, a married couple, that doesn't have a lot of money. I mean, is that, who, who is the gatekeeper here and how many people can get in place? So, so Fairfax is our building code. Under the, under the building code, you have to have at least 220 square feet plus a kitchen and a bathroom and then up to two people can live in that. So that's your one or two person product. If you want more than that, you need to have 320 square feet plus a kitchen and a bathroom. And because these units that we're talking about are efficiencies, that is the maximum you can have in an efficiency unit. The code doesn't allow more than three people. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand square feet, you still get more than three people with it. So that, that's how we will do it. Uh, sir? When you increase density in a neighborhood, particularly in an urban setting, how do you convince planning and zoning that you're not going to add parking rules? You do add parking rules. <laughs> At least Seattle don't have that problem. Um, you know, for, for what we're doing, our typical uh, multiple family housing product has a 1.6 parking space per unit requirement, um, which, you know, if you're just one person, that's pretty high, but if you've got three or four in there and everybody's got a car, you know, you've got a parking issue. Um, in the case of this, product to help reduce costs, we're looking at one space per unit, but if you're going to serve a population um, that doesn't drive or can be better served or ultimately served by mass transit, you can ask for a reduction to whatever amount suits the, you know, whatever the specific project is going to be. Um, convincing neighbors that it's going to be okay is a, is a huge challenge for our board and our public hearings are, you know, full of people coming to complain that there's already, you know, too many stray cars on their street or in their development, um, and that this will exacerbate that. So it is problematic. We love our cars in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, we will for a very long time in the future, so we do have to continuously accommodate that. And you know, we have Silver Line coming out to Tyson's Corner now. Um, so you know, our metro is is uh, coming around. So we'll see how it does. Donna, in, in, in addition to the parking issue, is there an assumption or no assumption? What dealing with school-age children, and what is the coordination with the schools, the increased density, and being able to accommodate them in the public schools? Well, they're required by law to accommodate them, so they will indeed accommodate them. Um, we we do expect this to be a um, you know single or couple with no children. That that sort of the expectation. Um, people with kids do tend to want more space, um, so we we don't preclude it clearly. Um, but that's the expectation, and you know, if a new, new bus stop needs to be established, it'll be established. We coordinated with our, our school office and the planners there, and you know, they said, well, you know, if they start popping up places, then we have to look at our bus routes, and they look at the census for the school district that they're in at the time that the application's approved, um, you know, and factor that into the school census data to, for population. Two quick comments on that bit in Loudoun County. And, um, I'm not aware of it in other counties yet, but uh, we're doing a large apartment complex. The surcharge for the educational fee is $22,500 per unit. Um, the developer has to um, give to the county the Board of Education to build those units. And then to the parking question, in the suburbs, it's one answer. In the district, we have to fight to get enough spaces. 
because if you're near a metro station, the parking ratio is one unit, one parking space for every three parks by code. And the parking, uh, or these cutting is only pushes you to be low and lead pushes you to be low, et cetera. But most of our clients and most of the marketing people say, if you don't have at least one or a parking space for every two units, you're not going to. The uh, micro units adhere to the same accessibility standards uh, as, as other units. So. We, we have our uh, adapt NYC uh, entry. I think 40% uh, of the bathrooms were ADA compatible. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, like in, um, I think, I think bathroom and kitchen made up 70 square feet of a. Uh, 275 square foot unit, so it's a pretty big, you know, pretty big hit. Um, but um, so, so we, we we found a way of making, making them adaptable. Uh, so there was a good chunk of them that were that were compatible. And for, if you're doing a new building, fair housing, you know, all the units that do that are that small comply with fair housing. And I have to say that create an efficiency that has a reasonable space for um, disabled accessibility, we are slightly higher as well. Yeah. Uh, well, you know,